Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, uh, it, it's great to be here. Actually, I live in Houston, Texas, so it's sort of nice to be anywhere it's not hot and humid or flooding right now. And so uh, the weather here was very nice. Although I have to admit, I was a little bit torn coming when I was asked to come and speak because I had to fly in last night. And yesterday afternoon was my three-year-old daughter's first basketball practice ever. We, uh, we signed her up at the local Y to, uh, to do basketball. As you can imagine, three-year-olds playing basketball is just too cute. And so my wife was sending me um, you know, tweets and, um, and text messages with videos. And so um, it was exciting to, uh, to see even remotely that. Now, I bring that up not just because I'm proud of my daughter, but also because of, as I think about sort of this topic of security and vulnerability and, and what we could do about it, I can't help but think that every time I take her to the pediatrician and um, you know, go in for her checkups, and she's three, and an, an interesting thought crosses my mind. Not that I'm 56 and have a three-year-old. That is interesting, but let's move on. What really crosses my mind is the fact that at the doctor's office, my particular pediatrician, no paper anywhere. Either she walks in with a tablet or a laptop. That's it. I mean, I've never, I mean, even when we get prescriptions, they're all done electronically. Everything is done digitally. Now, I realize that that's not the case for, uh, for all medical practitioners. In fact, my personal doctor, every time he walks in, he's got this huge stack of paper that he's thumbing through for me. But my daughter lives in the world at three where she'll probably, like I said, never sure. ever. And so this information is becoming more and more available. And what's actually interesting is that, you know, I just realized that's really a different language up there. <laughs> and and uh, I haven't seen that before. Yeah, okay, it's probably a font problem more so than, uh, than a translation issue. But what that's supposed to say is that what, what's interesting is that medical information is 10 to 12 times more valuable on the black market than your credit card information. And the reason why that is, it's because if you discover that your credit card's been stolen, what happens? You call the bank, it's canceled immediately. Well, what happens in the medical world, though, and, and why are they stealing it, by the way? You know, insurance claims, they buy medical uses of your medical data. But what happens is it takes medical institutions a long time and insurers a long time to notice that. So the thieves have a lot much longer lead time to use your information before they get caught. That's why it's more valuable on the black market. So what's happening is that we're putting a ton of information out there. Think about aggregations, financial aggregation sites such as Mint, Hello Wallet. I mean, all these different sites. There's just tons of information that we're putting out there. But meanwhile, we're just sort of accepting the fact that it's going to be hacked. In fact, um, the FBI director is saying that, you know what, there's really only two, two situations here. Either you've been hacked and you know it, or you've been hacked and you don't know it. That, that, that's really sort of the, the, the world that we live in. And it's sort of a sad state of affairs. And I used to think that it was because of this interesting confluence of technology advances. What do I mean by that? I mean that as more and more technology becomes available for us to use, in our personal lives. I mean, just think about how today, and in fact, it's interesting, I'm looking at a lot of people sort of taking pictures of the screens. What are they using? Of course, smartphones. You go back not too long ago, and what would they have been pulling out? Digital cameras. Okay, so, 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 so we're, we're seeing how the technology is just driving how we use our lives and how we store information. So I used to think it was that the reason why cybersecurity was such a big issue is because we were giving more and more powerful tools to cyber criminals as well. So the technology advances were impacting both us using them as well as those people trying to abuse them. But the reality is that it's much easier to walk in the front door than it is to sneak around the back. In fact, the Rob Joyce, who's basically the chief hacker for the NSA, he says, you know what? there's a lot easier way to get into systems versus trying to sort of get in using zero-day exploits. It's much easier just to use the known things. Why? Because people don't get the stuff done. You know, 80% of attacks are targeting known vulnerabilities. 
and 99% of those have fixes that have been published and made available. So it, it, it's like I said, people are just walking in the front door. You know, it's sort of like at, at my house, um, you know, I've only been married for about five years, so we're still sort of in that stage of working through things. They say marriage is the sandpaper that takes off the rough edges. I'm still being sanded down by my wife right now. And um, one of the things that I had to really work on was I'm personally not the most secure person in the world, so I, I probably shouldn't tell you that because I'll be mugged before I get out the door. But, I mean, I just... Um, I leave stuff lying around. Um, I never locked the door. We had to go to sort of the AT&T Digital Life because the door will lock automatically for you because I would leave it unlocked. Now, I don't talk to my wife about cybersecurity because I don't want her to know that that stuff can be hacked just as probably easier than just leaving the physical door unlocked. So I, I don't have these discussions with her. I just make her feel that she's secure by the fact that the door gets physically locked. But the point is that all too often, these exploits of companies are done against things that the company knew about but didn't take advantage. So the question we have to ask is, okay, why is that? What's going on? If folks know about it, why aren't they getting it done? Well, the biggest issue that we find when we talk with folks about, okay, why, why are things, and, and by the way, I think that's interesting, six months, six months from the time that an organization knows there's a vulnerability, they understand that there is a patch or remediation for it. There's six months between that point in time and the time it actually gets fixed. I think that's pretty yeah, amazing. That's question. Why does it take six months? The biggest issue is this idea of sort of this dysfunctional relationship between what's going on in security and what's happening in operations. Once again, like I mentioned, I've been married for about five years, and so, like I mentioned, we're still sort of working through things. And if you've ever read any um, new relationship books, they talk about love languages. Anybody familiar with that concept? We all sort of want to communicate in relationships a certain way. Mine is acts of service. I like to do things. My wife's, however, is words of affirmation. Actually, she claims to have all five. She says, I want to be talked about and affirmed while you're holding me and buying stuff for me and doing things for me. You know, that's sort of how she tends to think. But what happens is we all go to our, our go-to language when we communicate. And so it's sort of like if you travel internationally and you don't speak the language, what do you do? You don't try to learn it. You try to speak your language louder and slower and hope that'll make a difference. Well, we find it does it. And the same thing happens here in this space. Operations folks speak their language, speak their language. language, and very rarely, I should say, do the two try to work together to come up with a common language and common approach to get things done. So all too often when we go and we talk with customers, we see that they're incented differently. I mean, just something as simple as sev you know, severity levels. In the operations world, is the SEV1 a big deal or a little deal? It's a big deal. In the security world, you, know, you look at Qualys's um, sort of threat levels and how they do severity. SEV5 is the highest level of, of importance. So just something as simple as trying to get conversations around SEV levels. I was with a customer just last week, and they said that their operations folks, they know all of their environment by host names. Yet when they get list of security vulnerabilities from security, what do they come in? Exactly, IP addresses. So, so this is the problem that, that we see, is that there's this gap in this, this dysfunctional relationship that exists between security and operations. Some of the other things that we see and that we're running across is that because of the fact that people are starting to get really annoyed that's putting it mildly, about all of the, 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 the breaches and all of the sort of uh, exploitation of their of private and personal information, Congress is now stepping in saying, okay, we're going to add all of these regulations and new rules. Well, it, it winds up sort of being a catch-22 because, well, if the organizations were keeping up with the existing ones, they surely aren't able to now to keep up with the new ones. And so you've got that complexity. Meanwhile, going back to my earlier point about the difference in sort of incentives, what are the ops folks charged with doing? Keeping things up and running and performing well. Meanwhile, the security folks are charged with you know, mitigating risk. Well, many times those two things are at odds. So, so there's just this ongoing issue. The other thing that we find is that a lot of times people are trying to do things manually because 
there is, is no sort of consistent ongoing process. Everything's a Lisa one. says, okay, wait, we've got all these vulnerabilities here. Let's figure out what we're gonna do about it. There is no repeatable process, and so I have all these manual inventions. Well, like I said, if you just sort of have this conversation with folks, it's not too surprising then that you wind up spending six months dealing with just trying to figure out what to get done. So as a result, what's happening is that there is this sort of, I guess, confluence here or, or nexus, that whatever word you want to use, of where folks are coming to the realization that, yeah, we got to do something. Pretty much everybody is saying, all the chief executives are saying that we absolutely expect that there's going to be a rise in breaches. They're not going down. And so we want to do something, but what they struggle with is what do we do? You know, if you're going to spend money, where should you spend it? How should you, you know, what should you try to actually do to solve the problem or to reduce that, that attack surface? So we've got a thought. You know, our point of view here is just based on conversations we have with customers is, well, what if we could figure out a way to automatically remediate vulnerabilities and then free up your time to be more proactive? That's sort of what we're saying is that ultimately the organizations that are successful at this, this is how they do it. They try to automate as much as they can and then free up that time. Basically what they do is they bridge, they close that, what we call that SEC and the ops gap. So how do they do that? Well, we think that there's three things that, that they do and that they need to do. First is we need to think about, and I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail, but you need to think about this concept of vigilant compliance, or maybe another way of talking about it is ongoing compliance. I have a military background, and so um, I'm used to, and I have a lot of friends that you know, were missile men, that were um, you know, bomber pilots, and so you know, we were used to this concept of sitting on alert. And so when you sit alert, you go and you're just waiting. I mean, it's not if there's an attack, if something's imminent, we don't have to say, hey, let's call on so-and-so from home. They're sitting there poised, ready, waiting. It's the same concept here of saying, let's constantly be vigilant, let's constantly be trained, let's constantly be ready for an attack that might come. Let's understand that. The other thing is to let's understand this, this notion of precise threat analysis says, let's know how vulnerable are we. So what do we have out there right now? What do we know about the exploits that are there versus the ones that we're remediating? So where are we today? And then lastly, let's not be lackadaisical about remediation. Let's be relentless. Whenever we find something, let's get on it right away. So these are the three vectors or the three levers that we feel organizations need to pursue if they really want to reduce that threat service, if they want to reduce their likelihood of newspaper. Uh, so, Let's dig a little bit into each of these. How do we do this here? So the first thing around this vigilant compliance is to understand you know, what are the various regulations, what are the various policies that you need to be compliant with. So one of the things that we've done is we've said, let's go ahead and build those into the automation tools. Let's go ahead and provide organizations with the means of having out of the box, here are the policies, that, and obviously, you can't catch all of them, but there are some that are very well known. I mean, we just toss them up here as examples. There's some that are very well known. And what we're saying is, let's go ahead and get those, and let's understand what they are, and then let's set up automation that says, let's look at these policies, let's go ahead and look at our environment in an automated fashion, understand how we can look against the policies and see if we're doing okay. When I first went to work at BMC, I worked in IT, and it was right about the time that Sarbanes-Oxley was coming out. And so you know, we spent a ton of time manually having to go through and read the reg to understand what it was saying, what was required, and then go and manually look at the systems to understand, okay, are we in compliance with the reg? Man, goodness, let me see how this works. Well, fast forward 14 years now, that can all be automated. And so that's what we're saying is that let's go ahead and identify you know, which of these policies are applicable to your organization, and then let's figure out how to automate that. And ideally, what you really want to do, you see that sort of middle bullet there, is you want to make it sort of a full closed loop system as best as possible. Because so many of these things, they're known, you know how to fix them once the CV comes out, and so let's just go ahead and automate that, including logging the change. So if you could go ahead and you say, you know, here's the automate, here's the, the, um, the policy, let's scan our environment, here's how we're doing, 
Let's look at what needs to be remediated. Let's go ahead and make the change, log it. You can do all of that in an automated fashion. Now, some people are a little bit nervous about saying, boy, do we really want the systems to do that you know, truly automated? Well, you can stop, you can look at it yourself and make that decision, but the point is, have some means of automating this. Another, way by the, another reason, by the way, for, for automating this is because a lot of times automation isn't strictly about doing things faster, it's about doing things more consistently. And let's face it, in many organizations, there's really only a handful of people who truly know what's going on. I mean, that, that's just the simple reality of it. You know, they're, they're generally the folks that sit in your cab. You know, they're the ones that really know the environment, who know and understand what's going on. So, what they're doing with automation is we're taking the knowledge out of those people's heads and putting it in rules and saying, okay, let's go ahead, now we can get some consistency. So, so that's what we're talking about here when we talk about vigilant compliance. The next area is this idea of relentless remediation. So if you use a scanning tool like Qualys or Rapid or Nessus, what we're saying is they're gonna give you this information. Now, rather than just go ahead and hand off to the operations folks and say, here, here it is, what we're saying is why not pull that information in and tie it to sort of what's going on in your environment and look and see, you know, where are the vulnerabilities? And so in other words, once again, going back to this notion of automation, let's integrate the two things together. You'd probably have an automation solution in place, you have some sort of configuration management solution in place. Tie those two things together rather than just sort of manually handing off via a report or a spreadsheet or something like that. What we're saying is bring those two pieces of information, integrate them and bring them together. This is what we do in our, in our Blade Logic solution, but once again, whatever solution you may already have, there's chances are you could go ahead and bring those pieces a lot closer and, and tie them together. Because then what that allows you to do is to start looking at how to prioritize information. Because if we go back to what I said a little bit ago, what's the operations primary objective? Keep things up and running, okay, why? Because that's what the business wants. So if you've got vulnerabilities coming in, how do you know which ones you should fix first? Well, a lot of it depends. You know, I was a consultant in my former life, so the answer to any question, of course, is it depends. So <laughs> it depends on the business criticality of the system and you know, what's going on in the environment. Can you take down time? And so what we're saying is that you need some way of bringing all of this information together to be able to make these decisions. And that's this last piece here, this idea of what we call sort of threat analysis of saying, Let's have a dashboard that shows how all of this information comes together. And what I mean by that is, if you look on this particular screen, what we can show you here is you can see, okay, you know, what are all of the you know, known vulnerabilities that we have? What are things that we actually have remediations for? How many of those are still open? How many of those are being worked on? And the interesting thing is that you can now, if you have, service models defined in your CMDB, you can now also then start to look at and understand what's the business impact of leaving this particular vulnerability open. Because you may have a vulnerability that, you know what, it's an isolated system, it's not tied into anything, and so the, uh, the likelihood of it impacting our operations broader scale is, is low. We still wanna fix it, but it's lower than maybe something else that's customer facing and has a lot of sensitive data in it. So being able to add business context to the information that's coming from security, we think is pretty darn important. And so this is why we sort of invested and thought about trying to create and did, so to create this solution is to be able to marry those two pieces together. Now, for the first time, I could bring business context to my security data and give me true actionable intelligence and knowledge to be able to make decisions and to work on things. Um, the other thing I think I wanna point out here is the, other, the, the thing that I think folks tend to sort of miss is that oftentimes the reason, no, nobody's sort of sitting there maliciously saying I don't want to remediate, I don't want to do things. It's because, like I said, once again, the two groups, going back to what I said before, are incented differently. If we could bring those organizations together, so something else to consider is, and one of the things that we do internally at BMC is we have um, what we call service managers. And so in addition to 
um, having sort of the specialists that are security and operations, there's sort of an overarching person who's responsible for a given service. So our website, let's keep it really simple. Our external customer facing website, we call that a service. So there's one person who's ultimately responsible for that service, the full stack of that service. So that means that she's responsible, in this case, um, Becky, she's responsible for the security aspects and the operations aspect. So now she uses this to say, okay, here's my service, and I'm incented to keep it up, running, and secure. So organizationally, what we've done is we've now sort of forced the issue by bringing those two things together at the service manager level. So, so my point here in, in, is that it's not just about the tools. You're gonna have to think, I think, differently about your organization and your processes to say, okay, how do, we, how do we sort of help bridge this gap? We can absolutely provide tools and technology, but ultimately, it comes down to people and process as well, too. So, so I think it's really important to recognize that organizationally, you may need to make some changes to, to bridge this gap as well, okay? So, last thing I wanna talk about is, what do we see folks actually doing? What are some real world examples here? Um, we saw a couple of things, so like for instance in the state of Michigan, I was actually out there not too long ago, is you know, one of the things that where folks really sort of spend a lot of their time is getting ready for audits, and so they have to, the reason why it takes them so long is because they've got to go through, go back to what I was talking about, sort of rationalize IP addresses versus host names, they've got to figure out what they have, oftentimes they don't know what they have, they've got all these zombie servers out there, and there's just all of these issues. So what we're saying is that what the state of Michigan did is they, they used automated discovery as well as the automated remediation that we talked about. And so now what they're able to do is to look and say, here's what we need to be in compliance with. Here's where we stand by going through discovery and looking at the information that's in the CMDB and saying, here's the configuration, here's where we stand, and here's what's left to be done. And they're just running reports. It's not a, this big effort to go out there and do a lot of, a lot of manual work. So, so that's something that's done. Some other ex examples, I'm not gonna go through each one, but um, the Aegon one was the one that we're talking about, is that they're able to reduce the amount of time that they spend on remediation by 9,000. Now I wanna be careful because it's not about saying, okay, they were able to eliminate those people. They didn't do that. But what they were able to do is free up their time to be more proactive with folks. And, and that's really where I think folks wanna to get to is what they wanna say is rather than us constantly fighting fires and chasing after hackers, let's try and get ahead of them. Let's try and um, get in front of this problem. And one way to do that is to free up time from firefighting to actually doing fire prevention. And so that, that's what these guys were able to do by being able to automate a lot of their, their remediation, okay? And by the way, what I thought was interesting was that when they started doing this, they had 95,000 vulnerabilities. That's a lot. Now, they have a large environment, but still, that, that was a lot, and it was just because of that 193-day 193 193 uh, thing that we talked about. They were just sitting out there for so long, but now once they started doing a lot of things that we talked about, they were able to sort of whittle that down and knock those out, okay? Um, and then the last one here I'll take a look at is the, uh, the Transamerican example there. What was happening there was like I mentioned, sort of a similar situation to where they were spending a lot of time in trying to go through the various compliance um, regulations that they had to go through. So once again, they were able to use those out-of-the-box policies and blueprints to say, you know, here are the things that we really need to be compliant with, and then we were able to automate those for them. So ultimately, it all boils down to being able to religiously and relentlessly automate the right things to free up your time, okay? Took me less time than I thought, so I guess we've got time if you wanna sort of have qu ask questions. Hadn't planned on questions, but like I said, we got plenty of time, it's about 20 minutes, it's telling me we've got less, and that's my last slide. So, thoughts, comments, questions? Make sense? If not, we'll start again and try again. <laughs> Everybody's thinking, hey, I can still get to lunch on time. <laughs> Any questions? Did I see one in the back? Yes, sir. Um, sort of. We have um, 
some folks are, uh, some, like you said, some um, partners that are hosting this in MSP. It's not a true multi-tenant solution, but what they're able to do is they, they go ahead and turn around and host it and they you know, create a multi-tenant, but it's not a true multi-tenant solution. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah I'll, let me explain that. So the question was, just let me go back to that slide. I think I can. Oops, let's see. I think it was this slide here. So the question was, how does this really work? What, what is it we're really saying here? So what we're saying is that <clears throat> we don't, uh, we have integrations. We've developed, for these three specifically, we've developed out-of-the-box integrations into the Blade Logic automation tool for these three particular scanning solutions. There's hooks where you could build your own if you'd have something other than one of those three, but these are the ones that we give you out of the box. And so then what we also have is for these one, two, three, four, what, nine on the, on the page there, we've got you know, what are the um, sort of availability of patches that we automatically can look for. And so once again, you can build hooks, you know, additional hooks, but these are the ones that come out of the box. And so what you could do, once again, in this sort of truly automated fashion, is you could take in the scanning data from Qualys, for example, and then pair that up with your configuration information coming out of your CMDB using the discovery solution. And then you're going to get a list of environment, environment in, excuse me, host, the vulnerabilities, then you're gonna go ahead, once again, in an automated fashion, go through the catalog. So if you're talking your Windows host, you could look and say, okay, do we have patches for that? Yes, and they can be automatically deployed. And then we'll also go ahead then and update the change logs for those particular hosts that have been updated. So does that sort of answer the question? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and we, I'd be happy to hang out at the booth a little bit there and we could get, um, get some more questions answered for you. We've got folks sort of in the back of the room here that um, you know, the, the product experts that can sort of help you answer the specific questions as to some of the hows. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference.